Uh, we have got a great session lined up here, and it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Mike Niel Michael Nielsen uh, from the Astera Institute. will be talking about how AI is impacting science. Michael, take it away. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming along uh, to this uh, uh, afternoon session. Um, my talk is about AI as kind of a, a general purpose uh, technology, one that I wonder uh, about the extent to which uh, it's going to have a very broad impact across uh, the sciences. That's the relevance to meta-science in, in particular. Um, and uh, as a specific focus, I'm going to talk about uh, the impact over the last couple of years on protein biology. So probably uh, many of you uh, have heard that back in 2020, uh, biologists were very surprised when a deep learning system, AlphaFold2, uh, was shown to routinely be able to make correct near atomic precision predictions for protein structure based just on the linear sequence of amino acids making up the protein. So here uh, we have uh, each letter in this sequence uh, represents a single amino acid, you have a linear chain, uh, and somehow it folds up uh, into uh, this protein shape. This is uh, a human insulin over here. So uh, the first thing you might wonder, you, you, obviously you might be uh, a little bit skeptical of this, you might wonder if maybe uh, the modelers were fooling themselves, thinking that this was done in a cherry-picked way. Uh, it wasn't. In fact, it was done in a blind adversarial competition with more than 100 other modeling groups. Uh, in some cases, in fact, AlphaFold was better than experiment. It caused known experimental results to be re-evaluated and actually improved. This wasn't generically the case. It was for just for the case for a few of the uh, uh, structures. Uh, it looked at the time, and I think uh, subsequent events uh, bore the, have borne this out, uh, a major breakthrough in biology. So while that, that, that's kind of impressive, uh, I think really the right way to think about it is a, a bridge to a new era in protein biology. Uh, it opens up many, many questions. Some of those questions are meta-scientific questions, uh, questions about what we expect a good theory or a good explanation to provide, uh, how we can or perhaps cannot validate that understanding, uh, and what we humans can learn from these systems. And these were the, the subject of my talk today. Uh, it's also, and this is I think really the broad, uh, one of the, the two reasons why I was interested in the subject, whether and how uh, such systems may impact the progress of science as a whole, a kind of systemic uh, intervention. So I think it's valuable for meta-scientists to engage with AlphaFold as a concrete prototype of how AI can be used in science, even if you have no prior interest in proteins or even in biology. Uh, that's certainly me. I am not a molecular biologist. Um, I've just been learning it over the last few months, so my apologies for, for any errors uh, on that uh, front. Uh, but it's been enjoyable to learn a little bit about protein biology, so I want to take a few minutes just to remind you of some background uh, for those who, like me, are not biologists. Um, the first thing, uh, which I didn't actually know a year ago, uh, was that we know hundreds of millions of different uh, proteins. In fact, in the, the big metagenomics databases, there are billions of, of proteins. Um, and, and some of them are probably familiar to you. They're these beautiful little uh, nanoscale molecular machines. Here's the kinesin motor protein, uh, which is capable of carrying big uh, molecules, those are the big uh, globes, uh, uh, along microtubules uh, throughout the cells in your body. Uh, here's hemoglobin, uh, which carries oxygen, which is used to power cells at respiration. Uh, here's green fluorescent protein, uh, which uh, when you expose it to UV light, it uh, will fluoresce uh, green. Uh, it's used in, uh, or jellyfish uh, is where it was discovered, um, and it's also now used as, as a way of tagging uh, cells so you can follow uh, where they are. So you, you can sort of think of molecular biology, it's a bit like wandering into this really, really large uh, workshop full of all these wonderful machines uh, which have been created and sorted uh, by evolution by natural selection. Um, each one of these machines uh, could be the subject of, well, certainly, I, th I think, a lifetime's uh, a, a study. Um, there are thousands and thousands of papers, for example, about the kinesin uh, family of, of proteins, and yet we're really only just beginning uh, to understand it. But while there's a wealth of these biological machines, we don't a priori know what those machines do or how they do it. We have no instruction manual for the machines. Uh, so for the vast majority of those hundreds of millions of proteins which I mentioned, all we can easily determine is the basic blueprint, so that, that amino acid uh, sequence. We can determine using genome sequencing at a cost of no more than a few cents. In fact, I, I think probably the, the, the average 
uh, cost now is below a cent. But the proteins, or what they fold into, are these incredibly tiny nanometer scale 3D structures. They're very, very difficult uh, to image. And so as a result, to, to actually find the three-dimensional structure, it will routinely take months of work to determine uh, the 3D structure. Um, one uh, was it, the Protein Structure Initiative, uh, I think cost, in its first phase, $250 million, um, and uh, the average, they, they, structure, they found the structure for 1,100 proteins. So it's a cost of about a quarter of a million uh, dollars each. It's a big difference, big gap. So that discrepancy in cost and time really, really matters. It matters because understanding the protein's shape is absolutely crucial for answering questions like what antigens will an antibody or protein bind to as part of an immune response? Or what can the protein carry around the way hemoglobin carries oxygen? Or how do proteins form larger complexes like the way uh, the ribosome is formed? So there are many, many questions like that. And understanding the shape of the protein certainly doesn't tell you everything about its function, uh, but it is a key part uh, in understanding what the protein can do and how it does it. So ideally what we'd like to be able to do, and there are sound reasons from chemistry to expect this is often possible, is to determine the shape from the amino acid sequence alone. We'd like to be able to compute uh, that mapping. In the 1970s, people began doing physics simulations to try to determine uh, what shape a protein would fold into from the amino acid sequence. Uh, and many, many techniques uh, have since been developed. Some come more out of physics and, and some more out of uh, biology, sort of evolutionary uh, approaches. Um, a problem, uh, very similar to many studied uh, by people uh, here, is that it's very easy to fool yourself if you're a modeler. It's very easy to cherry pick results and to convince yourself that your systems are better than you, they actually are. For example, here's a really remarkable press release uh, from Johns Hopkins University in 1995. It's a very long, very enthusiastic press release claiming to have solved the protein folding uh, problem. And uh, I should say, I mean, these were excellent people who, who have done a lot of important work, uh, but they had just fooled themselves. To address this problem, in 1994, a competition was begun named CASP, the Critical Assessment of Protein Structure Prediction. Uh, and every two years uh, since then, CASP has asked modelers to do blind predictions of protein structure. And what I mean by that is they are asked to predict structures for proteins whose amino acid sequence is known but where the experimental structure determination is in process. Some other structural biologists uh, are currently working on it. Uh, they've been sworn to secrecy, um, but it's expected to be complete soon after the competition, so entries can be scored. Uh, roughly speaking, the right way to think about the scores I'm about to say, they're from zero to 100, is what percentage of amino acids uh, is 3D position is within some very demanding uh, threshold. So I'll just show you the CASP results from 2006 to 2016. This was the winner in the hardest category, the, the proteins that are thought to be most difficult, the median free modeling accuracy. And the winner would typically place roughly 40% of amino acids within that very demanding uh, threshold. There's typically more than 100 entrants, so this is a lot of groups, an enormous amount of computing power. Um, I'll say actually what the, the, um, uh, the score is a little bit more precisely. My understanding is um, that it's the average, the percentages of the it's kind of the, 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 core alpha, the, co the core carbon atoms in the protein backbone. Um, and what you do is you, you compute how many are within one angstrom of the experimental determination. You compute what fraction are within two angstroms, four angstroms, and eight angstroms, and you average those four numbers together. So it's a little bit complicated, but, but sort of one angstrom is an extremely good determination. Two angstroms is, is, is pretty good. Hopefully that gives you some flavor. Uh, so um, that's kind of the background. And then uh, Google DeepMind entered the competition in 2018 and 2020 um, and really just I mean, had a massive improvement in many ways. In fact, it's the, the second improvement in 2020, which is by far the most impressive. They scored 87 in this most demanding category. Um, and well, uh, just, to, just to sort of put this in maybe a slightly easier to visualize uh, or reason about why, um, the root mean square uh, distance uh, the median root mean square distance that they obtained for their predictions uh, was just under a single uh, angstrom, shown here on the left, and then you see the gap to uh, second place, which achieved a root mean square distance of, I think, it was 2.8 uh, angstroms, um, and then everybody else was about that as well, and this graph would continue for across the 100-plus uh, groups. Okay, so two casts back prior to that, the winner was actually more than 10 angstroms there. Right, so you got volumetrically a, roughly a thousand, more than a thousand fold improvement 
uh, it's, it's obviously a very large improvement in uh, the accuracy. Um, for comparison, the diameter of a carbon atom uh, is about 1.4 angstrom. So it's sort of atomic uh, uh, precision. Uh, in fact, it's also it's comparable to many experimental determinations. It's possible to do better than an angstrom, but I gather talking to, to biologists, the sort of one to two angstroms is, is, is often fairly typical. So in announcing the results of that 2020 CASP, the co-founder of CASP, John Malt, uh, said, to see DeepMind produce a solution for this, having worked personally on this problem for so long and after many, so many stops and starts, wondering if we would ever get there, is a very special moment. Um, uh, so he, he regarded it, at least, as a solution. And there's been a lot of discussion of what extent is it a solution or is it not a solution. Um, obviously, that's a very strong statement. Um, it's worth digging into in what sense it really is a solution. There are some senses in which it is, and I think there's a bunch of sen senses in which it is not. But uh, even uh, the competitors uh, to AlphaFold were very laudatory. Uh, here's just one, I think, fairly typical, very thoughtful uh, statement, part of a very long blog post uh, that he wrote about uh, this question uh, from Mohammed al Qarashi, um, who developed the first end-to-end -end models for predicting protein structure. Does this constitute a solution of the static protein structure prediction problem? I think so, but there are all these wrinkles, and he wrote thousands of words about those. Honest, thoughtful people can disagree here, and it comes down to one's definition of what the word solution really means. But the bulk of the scientific problem is solved. What's left now is execution. Um, so for what, for what it's worth. Um, in retrospect, a couple of years later, I think AlphaFold, it's clear AlphaFold is a huge leap, uh, but much remains to be done, even on the basic problem. Um, and many new vistas and important new problems have been opened up. Okay, it would take me several hours, unfortunately, to describe AlphaFold's architecture in detail, but I want to just, just tell you a couple of interesting things. Um, it's a deep neural, deep neural network, basically meaning just a hierarchical uh, model, uh, with 93 million learned uh, parameters. Uh, the input uh, is just the sequence of amino acids, the linear sequence. Uh, maybe you get it from, from genomics. Uh, and the output is in part a three-dimensional structure, so the three-dimensional coordinates of all of uh, uh, the amino acids. Uh, and there's also, it also outputs uh, confidence scores, so it will tell you where it thinks it's got it right and it will tell you where it thinks it's gotten wrong. That's also learned uh, from the model. The basic training data used is from the protein data bank. So that's humanity's uh, re repository of protein structures which have been experimentally determined uh, going back to the 1970s, those very difficult experiments I mentioned before. At the training time, that was about 170,000 proteins. It's about 200,000 today. Uh, a small fraction of those were omitted for technical reasons, but basically that's, that's what they used. Uh, and uh, as is always the case with these machine learning techniques, uh, the parameters in the network were just gradually adjusted. They started out very random, and they're gradually adjusted by gradient descent um, to ensure the network gives the correct output structure on PDB uh, inputs. Um, there are many, many other ideas which are used. That's the broad picture. Um, I, let me just mention one of the most, well, probably the, the most important other idea. Um, uh, it's an old idea, goes back about 15 years, uh, which is uh, not just to learn from the structure information which was known, but to also learn from uh, just the genetic information which was known, which there's much, much more. There's these hundreds of millions of known sequences. It's a very clever idea. Uh, it's to say, all right, we've got this sequence. Let's look for other similar proteins, which maybe, maybe it's the same protein but in a different species. So a few of the amino acids have maybe changed, but there's a lot of overlap. And so they construct these very large uh, sequence alignments and they look for correlated changes in the amino acids. So if there are two amino acids which are very distant from one another in the, the chain, but they seem to change together across in a correlated way, the intuition is that they're likely to be evolutionary uh, related. Um, uh, 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 and, and, and the reason why um, is, or excuse me, they're, they're likely to be evolutionary related, that's just true, um, uh, or uh, uh, sort of a fact. Um, the intuition is that these are likely to be close in space despite being distant in the chain, and they need to co-evolve together to preserve the shape and the function of the protein. That's just an intuition, it's, it's not necessarily a fact, um, but it turns out that using that idea really significantly improves the results. Okay, so in this way, uh, AlphaFold learns 
both from the known structural information, sort of the physics, the known physics in the PDB, and from the known evolutionary information in the protein sequence database. John Jumper, the lead on the paper, has this nice way of saying it's sort of the, the, the uh, physics is informing uh, our understanding of evolution, and evolution is informing our understanding of the physics, and kind of the network just talks backwards and, and forwards between these two uh, pictures. Okay, so obviously, uh, you know, a question one would have after to seeing that, oh, actually, let me uh, just tell you something I, I, I was uh, just reminded of yesterday. Um, I said there are many other ideas in the way this network learns. Something I love, uh, something that's just kind of buried in the network uh, is actually a language model, much like uh, GPT-3 or GPT-4. Um, it, it's kind of a small part of the, the loss uh, function. One of the things they do uh, in these uh, sequence alignment that I mentioned um, uh, is they mask out uh, some of the proteins and they, uh, some of the amino acids, and they try and predict them. Um, that's sort of part of the, the loss function. So they kind of see, uh, uh, they treat the amino acids uh, a little bit like uh, is done in some of these language models, which have so many people so so excited. Just wanted to mention that as kind of a, a parenthesis. Um, okay, so the, the the question, obvious question to ask is: Is AlphaFold maybe merely memorizing its training data, or is it able to generalize, or to what extent can it generalize? Obviously, CAS provides a basic validation. The competition structures weren't in the PDB um, and thus not in the training data at the time AlphaFold predicted them, so that's good. Um, it's actually uh, it's sort of slightly stronger than, than merely good. CASP is in some sense a natural sample. After all, the structural biology community isn't choosing which structures to solve for CASP. They're choosing them because, well, in part, because they're biologically significant. They also choose them in part because they're tractable. Uh, which is, is not quite the same thing. But it, so in some sense, at least, um, it has an ability to generalize to proteins of interest to biologists at large. It's kind of a basic sanity check. But of course, you'd ask, does deep learning work for proteins which don't occur in nature? Maybe as the result of mutations or because they're designed proteins or there could be many other reasons. Um, and I, I can't summarize that work uh, today. It would take hours. Um, there is a huge amount of work going on, and really it's, it's a mess. Uh, it's very easy, actually, just to find juxtapositions of papers that apparently come to opposite conclusions. Uh, you have papers saying that you can use it to study point mutations, others saying that they can't, others doing all sorts of design work. It's very interesting. A, a result that I particularly uh, like uh, is uh, from uh, OpenFold, which is an open source near clone of AlphaFold. Um, uh, and what they did, or one of the many things which they did, was they took the full PDB data set, and they removed 95% of it. In fact, they removed a very particular 95% of it. There are uh, topology uh, classification uh, in there, and they tried to remove 95% uh, of the training topologies completely. So there, there were just a whole lot of common uh, uh, topologies that are not in the training set. And then they retrained, and they obtained performance. It wasn't as good as AlphaFold 2, but actually, they obtained performance roughly the same as the first alpha fold. It would have been state of the art before alpha fold two. So uh, somehow it was able to generalize just from those five percent of the topologies. Um, and there's there's a, a lot of uh, results in that vein. Actually, one other thing I'll, I'll mention: something else that they do that's very nice in this paper. They also consider just just re, sort of more more randomly re, uh, eliminating things from the PDB. And they found that they got very, uh, results comparable to alpha fold, even with 90, almost ninety nine percent of the training data eliminated. And if they, they only, only eliminated 90%, I think it was, of the training data, uh, they got results only a tiny bit worse uh, than AlphaFold 2. Um, so you can certainly uh, eliminate a lot of the PDB uh, data. Anyway, so sort of core takeaway um, there is it's going to keep biologists busy for many years, figuring out the shortcomings of these systems and improving them. Um, but there's already been, I think, uh, quite a lot known and, and some increases in capability. Uh, part of the reason it matters, well, there are many reasons it matters. One uh, reason is uh, DeepMind and Embol uh, released AlphaFold uh, DB. Um, this is a database of 215 million protein structure predictions, um, including the confidence uh, scores. It also includes the near complete proteomes of 48 species, including humans, mice, fruit flies, and many of the other usual suspects. Um, so, sort of the picture you can have a it's a little bit cheap to say, but in some sense you can almost view sort of a lot of this, uh, the gathering of the PDB as really having been gathering training data for these machine learning uh, uh, systems. You, you kind of get this amazing thousand-fold increase um, in, in uh, structures. Of course, you don't necessarily uh, believe them, or that to, to what extent you should believe them is, is, is still a little up in the air. Um, it, it is remarkable 
you know, no additional experiments were done by AlphaFold, no additional data uh, were taken, and, and yet just by thinking it was possible to obtain a very large number of additional predictions that people expect to mostly be very high quality. I was chatting with a biologist about this and he, he just laughingly sort of made the, the, the comment, no one would take this AlphaFold prediction as true on its own, but it's an extremely helpful starting point and might save you months of work. He made the comment that if somebody uh, gave him a drug designed using AlphaFold, uh, if it hadn't been uh, you know, experimentally validated, he certainly wouldn't yet be willing to take it. Which, uh, I can understand. But this line between abstract model and experimental reality, uh, I think it may eventually become quite blurry. Um, in fact, the traditional experimental ways of determining structures require an enormous amount of theory, as is often the case across all of the sciences, both implicit in the tools and to just do the data processing. Um, if you believed that in some sense AlphaFold or some successor offered a better theory, you might believe the results from that deep learning system more than you believe a traditional experimentally determined structure. It sounds a little bit like uh, science fiction, but actually there are hints of this beginning to happen. Uh, in the CASP assessment, AlphaFold performed quite poorly on a few structures, um, some of, several of which had been determined using NMR. This is one of the three main techniques used. Um, it's relatively uncommon. And a 2022 paper from one of the people who, in fact, who did uh, the first uh, NMR determination of protein structure suggests that AlphaFold is actually often better, significantly better than NMR. Uh, they, they looked at 904 human proteins and they concluded that the AlphaFold predictions are usually more accurate than NMR structures. Um, I think that's, that's really quite interesting. Um, and of course, the, the reason why, well, you, you can understand, or there are many ways of understanding it, but, but um, an analogy I like is to thinking about how you interpret images from a telescope. Because how you, you interpret what they mean depends on your theory of, of optics. If you changed or improved your theory of optics, it would change uh, the meaning uh, that you ascribe to your so-called raw uh, data. In fact, something very similar has been required to understand gravitational lensing of galaxies. So experimental protein structure determination depends on theory in a similar but much, much more complex uh, way. If you're talking about X-ray crystallography, for example, uh, you need to do, you need to purify your protein sample, you need to crystallize the proteins, un unbelievably difficult. Then you do the X-ray diffraction, you obtain these two-dimensional images, and you have to, uh, procedures are needed, very complicated procedures, to invert and solve for the 3D uh, structure. And there, there are these criteria for when the inversion is, is or is not uh, good enough. A lot of theory is involved in all of these stages. Um, in fact, uh, at the final two stages, um, the solution often involves finding a good candidate search structure to, to start from, a good guess. And sometimes that's very hard to do, this molecular, uh, finding this molecular replacement. Um, and in fact, sometimes AlphaFold has been used to provide that search structure when it was hard to find in any other way uh, and has enabled the solutions for some particularly challenging structures. So I think there's already starting to be a somewhat blurry line between the model and the experiment. Um, I think figuring out how to, to validate AI solutions, not just here, but across the board, is going to be a, a really significant topic of, of meta-scientific interest in coming years. Okay, just to change topic uh, a little bit, let me check my time. Oh, okay, a uh, couple of minutes behind where I wanted to be. Uh, any model with 93 million parameters is obviously very complicated. It's obviously not a theory or explanation in a conventional sense. Um, can AlphaFold or a successor be used to help discover such a theory, even if only partial? Um, might, for instance, a simple set of principles of protein structure prediction be possible? Uh, and what, anyway, is AlphaFold learning? So we don't know the answers to such questions, um, but I think pursuing them is a very useful intuition uh, pump. Um, I'm going to skip over this. I just want to, I'll, I'll finish That's some things about what we've learned in chess, uh, which are really beautiful, but I don't want to. Okay, I will finish with just this question. Can we instead look inside neural networks and understand how they do what they do? It's, only, it's been done a little bit for AlphaFold, but I want to tell you about some striking results in a much simpler system done by uh, Neil Nanda, now at DeepMind. He was independent at the time. He trained a very simple single layer transformer neural net just to add two numbers, modulo 113. And the first thing the net did when it was learning was it just memorized all the examples in this training set, obvious thing to do. It could add those very well, uh, but it did terribly on everything else, just produce kind of random garbage as output. But as he kept training without changing his training set, he began being able to add examples which were not in that training set. 
Somehow, with no additional data, it was learning how to add. And he spent several weeks looking at the, the weights inside the neural network to reverse engineer what it had learned to do. Um, and he found basically a bunch of, to his own surprise, a bunch of, of, of trigonometry. Uh, and he, he says, this algorithm was purely learned by gradient descent. I did not predict or understand this algorithm in advance and did nothing to encourage the model to learn this way of doing modular addition. I only discovered it by reverse engineering the weights. And what it actually does, what that trig amounts to is, it creates a wave inside the network uh, with a frequency given by the, the number of x that you're trying to add. It does a phase shift by uh, uh, y over 113 radians. And then it, finally, it just looks for the inverse phase shift z, which gives you the flattest possible tone at the output. That's what it was learning to do. It's kind of a radio frequency engineer or group representation theorist's approach to modular addition. The question is, why did the network stretch to this switch to this algorithm for memorization? After all, it was seeing no more training data. And the answer is that during training, the neural network pays a cost for more complex models. The loss function is chosen, so gradient descent preserve, prefers lower weight models. And the wave algorithm is actually lower weight, so it is preferred. It is simpler, it is more able to generalize. It's almost a kind of a mechanical implementation of Occam's razor, preferring the simpler and more general approach. So by, by varying the loss function, you can potentially impose this kind of Occam's razor idea in many different ways. So I, I, I wonder whether one day we'll be able to do similar things for systems like AlphaFold, gradually simplifying them and perhaps discovering new basic principles of protein structure. That's everything I wanted to say. Um, there are, I think, many fundamental scientific and meta-scientific questions raised by AI systems. Um, as they get better and better, um, both at, at doing cognitive operations and sensing and accurating in the environment, how is that going to impact science as a whole? Are they eventually going to systematically change the practice of science? Will they speed up the overall rate of scientific discovery? And if so, what benefits and risks does that carry? Thank you very much, and my apologies for going a couple of minutes over. We have time for a couple of questions. Evan Miyazono from Protocol Labs. Uh, I was wondering if there's something you see uh, that is particularly special about protein folding, or given your experience with machine learning generally, if you see this abstracting to other problems that are either, uh, that are both difficult to do in one direction, but fairly easy to check that it is like potentially valid. I could think of this being like, drug discovery or like drug-drug interactions or even uh, like computer program generation where you can run it and see if it actually works? I think you can very naturally give two answers, uh, completely different, completely opposing answers to that question. You know, one you can say, well, it's only going to work for kind of these very complex systems where we have access to very good data and so we're able to learn from, from that data. So bioinformatics is a really good uh, target. Uh, maybe there are some other areas as well. Um, that would be the skeptic's response. Uh, six months ago, that's the answer I would have given. Uh, now, I, th I think I've been convinced, actually, thinking about general purpose reasoning and lab language as a substrate for reasoning, and models like Gato in particular, these multi multimodal uh, models, I'm starting to see, for example, people are starting to build protein systems that actually incorporate text as well, right, as sort of a, a general substrate for cognition. So I think more and more of them are going to get folded into these foundation models. And there I maybe start to think, in fact, we, we might see uh, progress in a lot of areas which don't seem to have access to really high quality you know, data in this kind of way. Um, that, that, that's, I think, how I'm at the moment gradually changing my mind is, is towards believing that. Very interesting. Um, just a quick comment on the, on the last uh, couple of slides you gave. I think one of the reasons why it found its wave function is because that the activation function was an exponential. So essentially, like you already told it, like use please an exponential to approximate this problem. The other question I have was in your alpha fold problem, like you know, what if we like you know, what if alpha fold was perfect? Would we then sort of like stop doing research on multi-body quantum systems and sort of accept that the problem was solvable by 93 billion parameter model, or or are we still then striving for simplification? You're certainly still striving for understanding. Um, you know, if you want to do things like... Uh, what, what, what do you mean by understanding? Um, well, we, uh, uh, in, in the 10 seconds, um, uh, uh, I won't try and answer that. Um, I, I think, just to comment on your question, 
um, which is a very complex and very interesting one, uh, you know, it starts to move where, chatting with biologists about how the, their own interests have moved, um, you, you know, they, they're moving to things like protein design, for example, where um, it might turn out that, in fact, similar systems are very useful, but it remains to be, I think, really comprehensively uh, demonstrated. But you still, in order to inform the design of those systems, you need to understand protein folding as well as possible, or protein uh, structure as well as possible. Um, so there's still a lot of understanding to extract from the system, even if it's perfect. Basically, it's the point that if you have an oracle for doing perfect predictions, it's somewhat interesting scientifically, but it's not that interesting scientifically. That's not all you want out of, out of science. Last question. Yeah. I have a question that uh, goes kind of across disciplines, across disciplines in the physical chemistry is what you've described, and also the computer science AI techniques, and also into social systems such as in law, in particular intellectual property issues and patent law, and kind of the question of how should we determine, especially using new AI techniques, where AI techniques allow an increase in knowledge in physical systems, whether we have a new invention or not. Is this um, computer program that uses AI, is it something that could be considered part of the knowledge base of someone skilled in the art? Kind of the issues, is it a non-obvious step? Or is this a new invention if the AI is actually coming up with most of the knowledge which solves a problem that hasn't been solved before? Or how, sh how should we deal with this to be able to determine, is this a patentable new invention, or is it just basic knowledge that we can add to our knowledge base? Another, another very simple, easy to answer <laughs> question. Um, uh, uh, of course, uh, there's certainly, I mean, there's at least two ways to think about this. So, you know, people are just beginning to sue companies that are doing generative art and generative uh, language. Um, and there's at least two ways of thinking about that. One is just the, you know, what does the law say? Um, and to what extent is it, is it applicable? Um, but the lawyers who I've talked to about this, they seem to feel that uh, at some level you, you, know, you actually need to go back to something prior to that. What was the original intent behind the law? Because of course it wasn't in, you know, in the situation where you can gather hundreds of millions of items uh, of, of training data and potentially repurpose them. People will say things like, oh well, you know, ChatGPT just spits out or Codex spits out um, uh, pieces of code which are already known. Um, therefore it's going to be found in, in some kind of copyright uh, uh, violation. Maybe, maybe not. Um, if it is found, that's a very easy thing to patch in the system, right? So it's not going to happen, even, even if that happens. So the fundamental underlying issue, uh, 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 I think, is going to remain, and uh, it's going to be a very interesting uh, uh, thing to, to, to see how people, uh, where people land over the next 10 or 15 years uh, in terms of what the, the, the underlying legal principles should be. It's a very wandering answer, but hopefully the intent was clear. Thanks. Thank you.